Welcome to Agile to Agility Podcast with Milan Bayic. Major show alert! The very first value we wrote is individuals and interactions. Let's take this to another level. Elon works the line in Tesla. He glues parts together, he rivets, he sleeps in a sleeping bag in the factory. When the executive team at Renault is willing to do that, then I'll buy Renault stock. But until then, it's <laughs> kids telling other kids how to put Lego sets together, and those are all going to fail. Who is Joel Justice? And like, well, how, how, <laughs> the, what, the, making, <laughs> the making of the Joel Justice? Like, I want to know, like, you know, where did you grow up? What got you into? Because, like, you know how I got introduced to Joel Justice watching a TED talk? Uh, or maybe just learning about Wikispeed, but I don't know anything else. And I think people want to know who is Joe Justice. What? <laughs> really? You want to take the conversation I, there? And we, we can do that, but that might be a pretty niche audience. <laughs> it's okay. Is Joe Justice? Is that, they'll be I, a niche. And they, yeah. they'd like, they'd want to know, but I don't think that's A little bit. Just tell us, that. tell us, you know, things that people might not know. Like what's been your journey? And like, you know, if you had to, kind of look from outside in, like who, how would you describe Joe Justice? Uh, what, what's important to you and what, uh, what got you where you are today? Oh man. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm happy to, if, if you want to, I'm happy to. Um, Let's time box it to uh, maybe, I don't know. What do you think is uh, fair? We, we, we can do, uh, I, I love Jim Benson's lean coffee. So we can check in. Yeah. Seconds and say this topic or a new one. <laughs> that, that's awesome, man. By the way, I'm uh, I'm talking to him. I think next week too. So uh, I have some questions, but yeah, let's let's time box it. Let's do that. I think Jim Benson is really a really not as well known as his genius should suggest. I, I think he's an undiscovered and not undiscovered. He's got thousands of people that know all about him and hundreds of companies mm -hmm. that know all about him, but it should be billions and millions based on his contribution, mm -hmm. contributions. And I, I think most people don't know enough about how awesome Jim Benson is. Uh, mm -hmm. So I think that conversation, if you're about to interview him. And I'll, I'll let him know what you said, because I feel like, I feel like same thing about you and others, like, you know, more people should be, um, you know, aware of your work and, you know, the stuff that you kind of stand for. And I think, uh, so, uh, I think he'll like to hear that, but let's come back to Joe justice <laughs> and tie box and maybe to a couple of minutes and see like, you know, so how did you get started? The, uh, what was your kind of like, how did you get in, you know, introduced maybe to, or to, to building stuff and, you know, eventually to agile. Yeah, well, well, people have asked that before. So if you don't mm -hmm. mind, I'm going to go one step before that question. Yeah. So that some new content in this podcast that I don't think I've ever talked about, you know, in any recording. That'll be right? even better. Yeah. Yeah. Let's make some, some stuff that only people can get here. So my ancestors on my mom's side came to the United States, the boat after the Mayflower. They were the very first settlers, the, the second boat um, mm -hmm. of settlers to what is now the United States. Uh, and we don't know why Dewey, Dewey is his last name, uh, came, but it looked like um, political disagreement, wanting to be, uh, but before that in England and most of Europe, if you had different religious beliefs from whoever the ruler was, you were legitimately tortured or killed, right? And it doesn't even mean they were that passionate about whatever their religious belief was. It's just that they didn't want to switch belief based on whatever the ruler did. So it's more of a political stance, probably, is what it looked like. So imagine someone who leaves for the new world on a boat. Like these are hardy people. These are hardcore <laughs> principles and goals driven people. And that's my ancestor. There's this book called the book of Dewey and it links Dewey's line, his parents directly back to Charlemagne. So whether Charlemagne's good or bad, Charlemagne was strong. And 
that's my ancestor. And then we go further down and they were big people in small towns, like during the gold rush, they ran the furniture store and the, the coffin making store. You, you know what, what people who make stuff do. So you have a mm -hmm. carpenter come to a town, what can they do? They can make furniture, they can make coffins, they can make hardware. And so they sell that to the folks going out to the gold rush. Well, and then they've made the majority of the money in this pop-up, this mini town that just happened, right? Mm -hmm. So they started the bank and then they buy stock in the mines and they became like the biggest to-do people in these tiny little towns. And that's my family. It's like successful startups. That's what a startup was, you know, in the gold rush. Back in the day, yeah. Your time, right? Well, they went on into World War II and my grandfather became a, a one-star general, a brigadier general. And what mm -hmm. he was famous for was how humble he was. He always introduced himself as a farmer. And as soon as the war ended, he went back to a farm and he never in his small town said, I'm General Dunn. He, he, I, I was told, he died when I was really small. I did yeah. meet him, but I was really small. But I was told he always introduced himself as Farmer Dunn. And his brother became a three-star general. They don't make many of those. Like right. that is completely unusual. And he oversaw the construction of Houston Space Center. He was head of the Army Corps of Engineers. And he oversaw the construction of Fermi Lab and mm -hmm. all types of massive infrastructure projects that then allowed all types of innovation to happen. So I like to think of this as the ultimate startup incubator. Well, not the ultimate, but a the concept of a startup incubator right after World War II is Fermi Lab or NASA, right? That's, that's what yeah. they were. And that's my family. Then my other great uncle uh, is one of the heads of one of the Ivy League universities or was. Um, and then my mom gets born and mm -hmm. she's an army brat and she's beautiful. I have a beautiful mom and she's the general's daughter. And mm -hmm. think of this dynamic, <laughs> so you've got the general who's like, uh. You, you, you report to the general, right? The general tells you what, when you can eat, you know? It, it, Is this all... where the Croatian side comes in? The Croatian dad or who? who, who... <laughs> oh, you, 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 this is all about to make perfect sense. This is all about to make perfect sense. So you have this European, long-legged, Swedish, Finnish, German, English, uh, general's daughter. And, yeah. um, and, as the general, like she was born in, she grew up in Turkey and then in occupied Japan, they had servants, they lived in a movie star's house, which is part of the awful thing that happens with war. I mean, you just take mm -hmm. the nice house and whoever's living there leaves or is jailed, right? I mean, that's, yeah. that's, that's war. Um, and that my mom grew up in that, in this, in this privilege. Interestingly, that wasn't lost on her, the sense of justice mm -hmm. and injustice stuck which is good right it, yeah it tells you a lot about the person if you're kind of aware of that like it's easy to get used to kind of the world that you live in and like to be humble yeah. to under, to actually understand it uh and uh, uh that tells you a lot about the character i guess of the person because um it's what i've learned is it, it's easy to get it's easy to uh get used to good and uh, nice things, right? But it's uh, <laughs> the you know. humans seem to legitimately get used to anything. Yeah. Um, but uh, I love you resonating with what I was also wishing to communicate that mm -hmm. some people choose to think is this just what can I do to improve the justice of this situation, mm -hmm. not yeah. only just cope with the reality, whether it's awesome or not awesome. Um, eventually she was stationed in Hawaii. Well, uh, her, her, her dad, the one-star general, uh, Ray Dunn, General Ray Dunn was stationed in Hawaii. And that's where she went to high school. And everybody wanted to date her is my understanding. I mean, I, I of course wasn't born yet, but that's totally uh -huh. my understanding. Is <laughs> she's beautiful. She's the general's daughter and she, and they have the ideal arguably post in, in Hawaii. And she then goes to uh, St. Mary's College, the sister school of Notre Dame College in South Bend, Indiana. And my dad 
is 100% Croatian. And, I, and I, as I think you are too, right? Uh, I'm from that. Yeah, I grew up in Sarajevo, not necessarily, oh, but yeah, it used yeah, to be yeah. all part of the same country. Yeah. Well, and but there's some really... Same people. Yes, it, same people. Yeah. And extremely similar, not same, but extremely similar culture. But I mean, really, you go down the street in Croatia uh, and Bosnia and Serbia and yeah. Montenegro, you go down the street and the culture is a little different. So mm -hmm. yeah, arbitrarily drawing national boundaries is, is pretty weird in a place like that because it's really similar and yet completely nuanced. Oh and I, what a beautiful part of the world in terms of yeah. people and culture and architecture and rocks and lakes and <laughs> everything yeah it's uh yeah it's uh I, I was so happy to hear that when you said that you have the roots in the balkans i'm like man now i see uh why i gravitate towards this guy and uh why uh i, I you know and uh it, it was just it, it was nice to hear but yeah so go sorry yeah by the way, checking, I'm, I'm enjoying this, so I think we just keep going with this. So. For now, and I've never yeah. talked about this on any kind of a podcast or anything, so yeah. if anyone was interested in this, this is the <laughs> only place it's been discussed to date. Yeah. Um, so my dad, he, um, both his parents came over from the Balkans, Croatia specifically, but in any case, you know, they all moved around inside mm -hmm. ancestrally, so they're, you know, from the Balkans in general, that part of the world happened to be Croatia. And uh, they both came to the United States. My Many people do ask about my name, and now I'll finally get to answer it. it my grandfather on my dad's side, his name was Ustich. Yeah, um, Ustich. Yeah. With a J. Yeah, uh, yeah Ustich. And um, in uh, Pearl Harbor at that time, they would Americanize everyone's name. If you were Paolo, if you were <laughs> Pal, it became yeah. Paul, right? Period. Yeah. It, it all, you, you became a simplification of all those things. And Eustace became justice because it was. Yeah. Similar. Yeah. Um, Eustich, it it's Eustich uh, in yeah, Croatian. And just now, like, you know, I would, if somebody gave me, uh, you know, I, whatever, like, I wouldn't have guessed. But like, that didn't just happen in Pearl Harbor. It happened in New York, oh, yeah. right? Like, when people yeah, say everywhere. it's just, uh, yeah. yeah. Oh, awesome. sorry, I didn't mean to say Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor is Hawaii, sorry. But um, yeah. yeah, in Ellis Island or wherever. Ellis people. Island, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and that's what happened to my grandpa. Well, my grandpa met my grandma um, mm. in uh, in Chicago, and she was also 100% Balkan, 100% Croatian in this case. Mm. And they, they got married. Now, interestingly, she like her mother which was not that uncommon back then had been sold as a house servant when she was like eight years old and so was completely out of touch with her roots and maybe the same with her mom before that i mean the world has become way more civilized in the last like two years and it's it's uh, pretty it's pretty hardcore right yeah. um so they meet and they marry and they open a restaurant in Los Angeles when Los Angeles was a, not a big city, like yeah. basically a, a port town, a hard working town. And my grandpa laid bricks, totally uneducated, really hard working, super muscular Balkan dude. <laughs> and uh, they had two, uh, they had three kids. One went to be a pro football player. So that's, my my uncle uncle john uh, yeah. uncle john justice became a pro football player in america and out of you know being born from pretty much poverty they ran a cheap diner uh, and, and laid bricks and the whole family grew up working in the diner in la but it wasn't the la we have now right this is 60 mm -hmm. years ago and then my dad uh, getting beat up all the time. <laughs> Smaller, <laughs> like his his brother John would take him to the park and say, "Who wants to fight my brother?" And you know, and, and, and it's for Uncle John, who's already big and muscular, to like prove his chops, but also to try to toughen up his brother to do him a favor, right? Yeah. So he had a broken nose. He had a deviated septum. 
and like from youth, right? He was just constantly <laughs> being beat yeah. up. Yeah. And he wasn't small, but he wasn't big like Uncle John was. He was he was like a normal, but you know, kind of fit guy. Yeah. <laughs> well, so he poured himself into academics. He's like, how am I going to get out of this? And he got his PhD in nuclear physics from Notre wow. Dame under scholarship. Wow. I mean, he had no money. So it was all scholar, well, not much money. They, the restaurant did okay, but they, they were, mm -hmm. but they were lower middle class at best uh, and, and from nothing. So already a success story, I think. Yeah. And he uh, put himself through private college, one of the most prestigious colleges at the time um, in the new nuclear engineering, nuclear physics department. He then taught nuclear physics at Notre Dame and uh, he invented a device that helps treat cancer with radiation therapy. Um, got the patent on that, I think. His PhD was on the beginnings of that device and then I think patented it. And then he moved around uh, setting up what's now called radiation oncology departments, uh, mostly in the US, I think only, no, mostly in the US. So every three or four years, he'd go to a new city because he'd been hired in to found their radiation oncology department. He would install his machine or a, a derivative of it, and he would mm -hmm. teach people how to use it and also the business of the hospital to run it. Well, when he was teaching at Notre Dame, the sister school was St. Mary's, and there was this beautiful lady walking around kind of like <laughs> on the place. So he uh -huh. taught himself to play the guitar and he, he would like play in the park. And yeah. so you have this like, not as huge as my uncle John, the pro football player, but you know, this pretty muscular fit, really smart, uh -huh. guy with, you know, tan skin and he's playing the guitar and he, and he wooed her and, uh, and, and things, things will do for a woman, together. huh? <laughs> oh man, the things people do for what they really like. Like, it's crazy, yeah. And he decided he really liked this lady and she decided she really liked him. Huh. And uh, and they had six kids. They got married wow. and had six yeah. kids. They did it in the right order at that time. Not everyone did, right? But, but they did, <laughs> they got married yeah. and had six kids. Uh, and I'm the last one. I'm number six. And everyone in my family has gone on to do nutty interesting stuff and <laughs> it, it's it's a bizarre parallel life um mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah and me being the last one like um everyone except me went to what's called classical education most people call it that where you spoke latin studied greek learned to play the recorder uh all of your school plays were Shakespeare or similar classical education. Mm -hmm. I didn't. Um, that school, those schools where, where folks went were really changing by the time I was coming around and the finances were quite different and a lot of stuff was happening. So I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, but I grew up with four sisters and a brother speaking Latin, writing in <laughs> Greek, um, pinning bugs to cork boards for uh, biology class, like actually studying uh, vivisection and stuff. Mm -hmm. And that, by the way, is one of my earlier memories is being so freaked out at the injustice that we would kill, it, it was a cricket is what it was, uh, mm -hmm. a grasshopper, to study it. Like why, how unfair if we were thinking from the grasshopper's perspective, this hand comes over it from somewhere huge and then puts it in a jar with a mothball of nail polish remover. And so it fades out and it's life's over. It's like, why is that fair? And wow. I was screaming, let the grasshopper grow. Or I don't know what I was screaming. I was crying, let the grasshopper mm -hmm. go. I was like six, wow. five, six. Um, yeah, that's one of my most early memories. And I was born legally blind. Um, and no wow. one noticed because there were, I was, there was five other kids. Yeah. And they're like, Joe's just really clumsy. And, and like, I was riding a bike. They're like, why didn't you stop for the stop sign? I was like, what stop sign? Like, I could not see. Yeah. Wow. And people did not know. And I was really smart. So I kept up in school, even though I couldn't see. 
they're like, his handwriting's really bad. <laughs> I just didn't know until I was seven. And people I probably would, wouldn't, especially like uh, probably for your parents too. It's like, you know, you, that's the, especially with a sixth child, I guess, you know, that's the last thing you think about. Cause <laughs> oh, totally. They're like, is everyone alive? Uh, did anyone lose a finger? Right. Uh, and it's just different when you've got that many. Mm -hmm. um, and so as, as an adult, I completely forgive everybody. But at the same time, it, it's frustrating that I like that shows how much attention I got. Right. <laughs> like, that's, that's just real. That's just what it was. Uh -huh. <laughs> like, he was blind and no one noticed for seven <laughs> years. Like, that's that's legit. That's what happened. Yeah. Um, three eye surgeries later, I uh, now I see really well. Although now I'm I'm 41. I'm almost 42. My eyes are starting to get bad again. So I'll, I'm sure I'll get glasses again soon, or maybe another eye surgery. But something. Mm. Yeah. So that brings me up to seven years old. Um, uh, because everything was blurry and mm -hmm. like severely blurry. Like <laughs> I, I saw light and color, but it was just, I, I didn't know who was who. I didn't know who was my family, who wasn't. So I'd really um, cling close. Yeah. You know, even at, And when you're three, that's okay. But when you're seven, they're like, something wrong with that boy. <laughs> yeah. I was like, if I lose your hand, I don't know who you are. I can't find you again. And no one understood that. So they're like, why is Joe clingy? Um, but what I would do is draw. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the reasons why people didn't think I was blind. And it was impressionistic, you know, colors. Yeah. And, and I would spend a lot of my time doing that because I could just sit there and draw. And then I knew my family would come find me again. Wow. <laughs> right? Because I was in That's the crazy. Because like, uh, I can never, like, I can't personally relate to it because I always had good eyesight, but my son has, he's four years old. Congratulations. And he's, thank you. And he has like, uh, you know, some sight issues and like, and, uh, uh, you know, like, you can't really, I mean, I, I can try to empathize, I can try to put myself into, but I can only imagine, like you said, you know, like, that you're clinging to something because you know you don't know you don't know there's a lot of unknown right yeah. uh and that probably shapes you as a person right uh, for sure yeah for sure i i it, it's awesome to try to understand the continuation of the emotional connections the stimuli that help mm -hmm. make companies that help make products that help make services that help make people and mm -hmm. we have no bigger data set than ourselves. So mm -hmm. trying to understand other companies, other people, other systems by looking back at our chain of connections is super fascinating because it works, right? Mm -hmm. You can see the connections and parents have such an edge because <laughs> they get to study something with an adult mind from when it was born up until mm -hmm. wherever it is now. And parents and grandparents really get this stuff. They're like, well, I see how that company did X because <laughs> yeah. they, they can see how, how kids in general do this, especially if they all grew up in the same neighborhood where kids played together. So they see a sample size of like 20 kids and yeah. know something about their upbringing. And then they look at a company and they're like, oh yeah, I see why they have a culture of sit down meetings and slow <laughs> innovation. <Yeah. laughs> you just get it. <laughs> it, it. It's funny how solvable the problem is. It also makes sense why companies repeat and so often have the same failure modes or failure modes, modes. Yeah. so maybe to shift gears a little bit that just reminded me and what i wanted to talk to you about is you recently worked at tesla and yeah. uh, like th that whole experience like working at tesla could you maybe talk about it like uh what did your day look like and uh when it comes to agility and innovation like what are they doing that most people wouldn't know like, yeah. you know, because it's it's some of it, like, based on what I've heard you say, I mean, it's out there. Like, you know, there aren't that many companies, at least, or the, it's not well known that they're doing that. Or maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. But what did you learn at Tesla? What do you think people would find interesting? Just this morning, I was in a, a meeting that I, I'm really grateful for, put on by Steve Denning. And Steve Denning was a manager at the World Bank. Uh, mm -hmm which is still a force globally, but during his heyday is when Steve Denning was even more involved. 
and the other attendees are all movers and shakers that care about agile. So it's um, really accomplished people, uh, many of whom have billions of dollars that they influence how it's spent or Euro or, or Yen or mm -hmm. et cetera. And, uh, and they all care about agility and they, they meet um, on, a, on a regular cadence to discuss mostly management issues is what it comes down to. And despite how cool these people are and how awesome Steve Denning is, that agile mindset leadership summit kind of, that's not what it's called, but that's sort mm -hmm. of what it comes down to. Conversations about leadership from people who care about agility and are in positions of power is so flipping boring. <laughs> it's so irrelevant. Uh -huh. They're talking about, do we use fast goals or do we use smart goals? Do we, what kind of meetings do we have? What kind of leadership attributes do you hire? And I just stay on mute most of the time. When, when I do unmute, people look at me like I've got three heads because it's such a different conversation. Mm -hmm. I, wow. So to segue into what you actually asked, the Musk companies are so different that even the successful agile companies look like irrelevant. Yeah. Because maybe they're, they're not so agile. Cool. I think if you look at it, like uh, uh, mass is all about agility and having options. And, uh, and like we, a lot of us call ourselves, including myself, agile, but like we have no idea what these companies are doing. So what are some of the insights? Like give us examples, cause I've heard you talk about it. Like how does it work at Tesla? And like, yeah. you know, the people will go like, yep. <laughs> That's how. It... I, I will say it. Um, there's some stuff that I really wish I could say that I don't get to say. It's still under non-disclosure, but interestingly, there's some really powerful, I think, uh, mm -hmm. effective stuff I do get to talk about. And so I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that. There aren't meetings, there aren't leaders. And I've said, I've tried to say that before. And I, I think people then don't know, well, then what is there, right? Um, I'd like to try an analogy that maybe years ago I thought and said, but today I, 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 I think it really matches. So I haven't said this at least recently. Elon Musk wants there to be people living on Mars self-sustainable, right? He's got this goal that if a meteorite hits the earth or whatever happens, there's a backup of the human species in as many places as possible, starting with Mars, because it's the next likely most achievable sustainable place. Uh, so that's the goal, right? Elon Musk isn't trying to make a company to sell. Elon Musk isn't trying to make a product that he wants to sell. Elon Musk isn't trying to make a service that he wants to sell. He's got this goal. Mm -hmm. And it's how do you fund that? And so now you bring in the idea of business. Okay, so first there's this goal. And then how do you fund that? Okay, well, there's two circles. Elon says there's how many people can afford to go to Mars and how many people want to go to Mars. And he says, you've got to grow both of those and make them overlap. So you have to make it cheaper to go to Mars and you have to increase global wealth. I mean, which is already interesting. Most people are like, how do I make a service that people want to buy? That's not the mind at all. <laughs> and, then, and then the other side, it's how do you make more people want to go to Mars uh, of people that are interested in growing their wealth, you know, so that they'll overlap. And, and yeah. so now you've introduced business. And that business already has a social good angle. I mean, one is get people to Mars, which is arguably the biggest social good, a backup of the human species. Mm -hmm. The other one is how do you grow people's wealth so that they can afford, right? So he's Worth like, how do I make money. other people have more money, right? Yeah. <laughs> it's like an anti-business model. Yeah. Well, that drives all the decision-making. Then the company is, it's a, it's a printer. SpaceX is a printer. Tesla is a printer, like, like a, like an inkjet or a laser jet printer. Yeah. If Musk could buy 
a laser jet or an ink jet on Amazon that would print out Starship rockets. That's all he would do and it'd be uh. done, but he can't, right? That, that's not a product yet. So he's like, how do I make that printer? And that's it. Well, how many liters do you need inside your inkjet printer? Depends how much you want to print. <laughs> Zero. You you want some pieces of metal that move around and ink uh -huh. and like it's about materials. If you look uh -huh. at SpaceX hiring list, there is not one executive position. They, they don't have them and they don't hire them. Gwen Shotwell is COO. Well, mm -hmm. what she actually does is everything, right? But functionally, the primary responsibility is sales and not like a traditional sales organization. I mean, actually booking deals, I, I, mm -hmm. I, being a little bit facetious here, but how she does that is even different than most sales organizations think they're run. So calling it a sales organization is a bit of a misnomer, but what she does is she books launches. She gets satellites booked. She, she's basically the buy it now button. Yeah. <laughs> you have questions about the buy it now button talk to Gwen Shalva uh -huh. and there's no leadership positions they don't exist what they have is welders I mean think about it like a printer if the yeah. printer was making spaceships what would happen in the printer there'd be welders there'd be a lot of robots do you need some people yeah you need maybe now with the current state of technology some people you need people that program robots look at SpaceX hiring people mm -hmm. who program robots. You need people who buy metal. Now, largely yeah. that's automated, right? Because you write software to do what people do. So people yeah. only do the creative work. Mm -hmm. And this is something that I, I am becoming famous for saying, and it's totally true in the Musk companies. People do creative problem solving, automation, robot software is for everything else. Mm -hmm. So if something's a standard operating procedure in the Musk companies, it's a software script or a robot. And it's a printer. There's no leaders. There's 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 managers in that there's like group leads, not to answer questions, but to model good work to keep mm -hmm. people upskilled. It's almost like an apprenticeship model and fast forward. Yeah. There's that. There's no hierarchy. It's flat. There are no meetings. There's no chairs. There are almost no chairs. There's no desks. There are not thought leader positions. I mean, search like agile leader in the must company yeah. it, it, it doesn't exist yeah. search leader anything so if you search project manager you're going to get almost no hits and the yeah. one and there's thousands of open positions across the must companies so this is not uh it's a meaningful search the sample size is large but what you will get is new product introduction technical project manager and that means you're programming robots, you're pulling sleds of parts, you're buying parts, you're configuring machines, you're anchoring machines to the floor with bolts. It's a printer. And the only positions are what you would have inside a printer. Mm -hmm. And when Musk says the factory is the product, that's what he means. He's, he's making a printer that makes spaceships. He's made printers that make cars. He's making a printer that makes Neuralink systems. You look at Neuralink, there's not like chief architect. Mm -hmm. It doesn't exist. Instead, there's like, if we're going to make a million of these Neuralink implantable devices a year, what do you need in the machine that makes these? these and yeah. that's the positions. And that's but that seems it. like, you know, it's like the future, right? Like that's the, if you can do that as a business, you know, that's your competitive advantage. That's, that's, uh, uh, that seems like, you know, at least when I think about like, uh, you know, look at the car manufacturing, well, not even car, like they don't even call them cars anymore, right? Technology that moves or whatever the slogans are. <laughs> uh, but it's, it, it, it's, it, it's who's going to, you know, do exactly what you just said. What's interesting is the Musk companies continue to ramp in value and their products continue to ramp in terms of quality. Already mm -hmm. Tesla's have the highest quality marks of any car company ever made. Uh, they didn't before, but they do mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And they have the best financials. They didn't before, but they do now. And Hyperloop looks like it might do the same thing. Starlink looks like it might do the same thing, mm -hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then that question, who else is gonna do this 
it's agilists. It, it really is. And I, I will introduce a divider in agilists. Mm -hmm. Agile started <clears throat> from a few people who were doing work and helping other people do it. They, they were like um, charismatic lead developer types. And they were really good at making stuff, mostly software. They're really good at making stuff. And they would like to help other people make stuff. And they discovered what's a really lightweight way to coordinate with groups of people to make stuff in really effective ways. And then some consultants came in and tool vendors came in and said, how do we make Locked everything up? <laughs> how do we make consulting and tool vendors and training out of this stuff? And they had nothing to do with these charismatic people doing work. <laughs> well, yeah. if you look at Musk, Musk doesn't do any agile training except, except what I brought in. <laughs> like that's it. The only agile training in the Musk companies is, is the ones I did. Yeah. Is the one I set up or, or, or conducted. And uh, they don't do any consulting. And if you look at all the big established consulting companies, they're too slow for the Musk companies. Mm -hmm. it, they're irrelevant. They have no value to add the Musk companies. So they, they don't get in. N none of those other agilists, tool vendors, consultants get in. Who gets in? The people who make products in groups. <laughs> who are the... Yeah some of the original agilists and some of the people I still tremendously respect, though they're super welcome in Musk companies because mm -hmm. that's what you'd want inside a printer. How many training classes need to happen inside your inkjet? <laughs> None, yeah, yeah. it, it yeah. doesn't matter. How much <laughs> training do you need to be a really good nozzle to spray ink? All you need is a good definition of done and definition of ready, which is part of agile, right? Yeah. But you don't need any waterfall plan to do that either. So it's not like waterfall versus agile. It's like doers versus not doers. And agile doers will be able to thrive in a Musk company. So then why do you think that is? Is that the mindset? Is that just that people have bias towards doing? Like what, what's distinguished the, what distinguishes the agilists from others? Well, I, I actually think you could answer that question better than anybody. Um, so I'd actually like to ask you that. And then if any of it's really didn't match what I thought I learned in the Musk companies, mm -hmm. I'll say, oh, but maybe not that part, but would you try? Well, I've not tried. Sure. sure. So like if I, if I would uh, uh, look at it, I would say that it's experience. It's, uh, it's a holistic view, right? If you, if you're just focused on your own way of doing things or specialization, uh, that you're doing, uh, that kind of limits you. But if you understand the bigger picture, if we're creating like, what's the goal and what's the, uh, what are we trying to do here? And you can say, yes, I can help here and I can jump on this. That's what people want. They don't want people sitting around. They want, like you said, doers like, hey, you know, this is what I'm, here's a problem. I can jump in and help on this. Here I am, right? So that, that, would, that, would, uh, that would be my kind of answer to that. May I add to that, because I only yeah. agree, I, I, to, to put a fine point on that, I, I will say what I'm trying to say here by Agilists is people who have a functional user-facing definition of done in mind all the time. Mm -hmm. And folks who think in phases, but it's a phase that doesn't yet get to the customer, like I do design or I do field validation, they mm -hmm. don't fit. They don't fit in these companies and they're frustrated in these companies because they're being asked to think end to end all the time. But people who are comfortable working wherever they are, maybe the product doesn't exist yet, or maybe it's a legacy product or a collection of legacy and new, I mean, that doesn't matter. You walk up to a system and think with the functional value creating end in mind, what do we do next? Yeah. And, and that's what a sprint was supposed to be. But now you have planning sprints and PSIs and all <laughs> kinds of stuff that would never fit in a, in a Musk company. So you have these doers and they're comfortable working alone or with groups or with huge groups. And it's faster when they work in groups. There's awesome data around mob now. And almost mm -hmm. everything I did in the Musk companies is basically mob. Mm -hmm. um, so, but they're, they're comfortable walking up to a system at any state 
and helping the end state and they're not thinking in terms of mm -hmm. segments most people will say phases but you could also call a version a phase a v1 mm -hmm. that faces the customer a v2 that's fine right but uh what we don't want is a plan phase so people yeah. who say i'm a planner they have no place in these <laughs> companies yeah People who say, I'm a test and field automation engineer, they have no place in these companies. People who say, I work on products, that's this agilist. Mm -hmm. And they fit really naturally and really well. And Silicon Valley is so full of these people that they just can't even talk to traditional consultancies anymore. Cause yeah. they're like, <laughs> you, you don't understand me. You don't understand my companies. What, what do you mean you're, you're trying to improve my financial validation phase? I, I don't <laughs> even know. No, I'm not going to hire you. <laughs> and in fact, I don't exactly. even want you talking to my people. You're going to slow them down and pollute them. <laughs> <laughs> but that's, uh, but like, look at the, look at the agile, like you, you referred to it, like the whole, like, you know, the, what we're part, at least, you know, partially, I guess the uh, uh, consulting training, you know, it's, you know, we all know it's a bunch of BS in a sense, right? Junk. Um, it's total yeah. junk. For a broken, slow company, it's a stepping stone. Mm -hmm. And I love that. So scaled agile framework, many people will accuse as being the most complicated and slowest of all agile frameworks. It has a really valuable place in the world because mm -hmm. some companies are on 12 month new product introduction cycles or slower <laughs> and everyone's arranged by non-customer facing phase. Yes, mm -hmm. introduce scaled agile framework. It'll be so much better than the horrible world you're in. <laughs> but yeah. by comparison, that's also a slow, horrible world. So at some point that will need to be transcended, but yeah, those yeah. are stepping stones. It's, if you exactly. wanna go into GE power and light or anyway, some massive company, all these frameworks, all these trainings have a place, but then someone like me is frustrated because yeah. you're in these slow, toxic companies all the time. Way more and, yeah. to actually go into one of these fast companies that doesn't need any of this training. They don't need any of these stepping stones. You just do, you just, you just work. Yeah, I mean, it's like at some point, you, you know, things are going to catch up with you, right? You know, I joke around, but like, uh, look a year ago when COVID hit and like, look at the grocery stores. Like they never thought themselves as uh, like my grocery experience should be a lot better <laughs> than what it is uh, today. And it's like when everybody sucks, it's okay to suck, right? Uh, in an industry, but eventually somebody like either Amazon or like with Amazon, somebody's going to come and disrupt it and you, you, in that point, you're screwed. Because you can't fast track or you can't, it's going to be very difficult. Like mask manufacturer having these really distributed slow global supply chains. So it gets disrupted and it's four months or more till new masks come. And people mm -hmm. are like, maybe that was actually a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> There's lack of agility, right? Um, yeah. What was the I, biggest, like, what was the biggest like thing that you learned at Tesla? Oh, or maybe things that stood out to you, like, you know, maybe something you were surprised by that you didn't expect. I'd been working as a, as a consultant and trainer in so many slow, wealthy, but slow companies for the last six years before that, mm -hmm. that what stood out to me the so, so much is that this agile stuff actually works. Um, I mean, I mean, I'd, I'd done Wikispeed before, which is what enabled me to know this well enough to do all the consulting and training I did after that. And then I spent six years making money and I think helping companies, but helping wealthy, slow companies almost exclusively. And that is disillusioning, right? Mm -hmm. Because all you see is silo based skills, separated, slow companies getting into the Musk companies. And I dabbled before during that time, but actually fully dedicating myself as a full-time employee. Mm. What that did for me is it was validating. Oh yeah. Okay. You don't need any hierarchy. You don't need any leadership. Every time I internally felt frustrated being in a planning meeting, 
I remembered, yes, you don't need any planning meetings. You don't need any meetings. And, and, and it's okay to not tolerate that slowness and waste. It's okay to have this allergic reaction to slowness and waste. Um, Cause if you don't in a Musk company, you won't, you won't fit, right? You need to just not mm-hmm. tolerate, not action. Um, it's not only a bias towards action. It's also a, a comfort and confidence. Okay, here, this stood out. Um, yeah. How do you make this sustainable pace? And the Musk companies are famous for 12 hour shifts, for people in their 20s without kids working there. What, what stood out to me is in the area where I worked most of my time, I worked across the entire company, but I had a home base essentially where I, where I worked most of my time. In that area, more than half the employees were women and most people were not in their 20s. There were some 20 year olds, men and women, super strong. I mean, they can just really work because of your genetics at that age. Yeah. But there were some people in their 70s uh, there were, and, and it was more than half ladies, which some people think the culture might be too macho for that. Not at all. Not at all. It was more than half. And what stood out to me is what made it sustainable for those people, because it's, you're doing all day, right? Mm-hmm. Well, imagine someone who works in a department store, like maybe they work in the shoes department yet pre-COVID. I don't know if we'll ever have this again, but I think some of us still remember someone who worked in a shoe store and they're they're always like cleaning and arranging the shoes. They're checking back stock because there aren't many people working in the shoe area. And they're like, how many of these do we have and what size and what color? A, A guest comes in, a customer comes in, what would you like? And they're on their feet all day. They have no desk, right? They don't have one. And they're getting up and getting down. They're sitting down and sitting up. They're putting shoes on guests. They're, they're being polite and cordial. Well, some of us have met people that have done that their whole career. And may, maybe now they're, they're a grandparent and they're yeah. still working in the shoe department. They have no desk. They're on their feet all day. And maybe they've been doing it 12 hours a day. Maybe they own the shoe store, right? Mm-hmm. Well, people have been doing that for generations. That's not a new yeah. phenomenon. Yeah. That's who succeeds in the Musk companies. Mm-hmm. And, and if you think of some elderly lady who runs a bakery shop or something, you know, they've got their own boutique or a cosmetic store or whatever, and they're just on their feet all day. They don't have a desk. Maybe there's a stool they sit on behind the cash register sometimes, but they're doing their store and they maintain the sign. They're full cross-functional. They understand the business. Mm -hmm. They keep their own books. That's not a new concept. That's agile. And yeah. And uh, you know, that just reminded me of to just bring it a whole circle back to. uh, So when my family immigrated here in 95, like my dad was engineer at electric power station, you know, and like coming to United States without no English, they worked two jobs in like minimum wage. And like, it's that you have some kind of purpose. You have some, like, they never felt like they were tired. They worked two jobs. They, they, they were, uh, you know, excited to be out of that mess, right? So I don't know, like, uh, you know, obviously uh, to work at that, you know, capacity and that you have to have some type of higher purpose or alignment to the higher purpose. Or maybe, I don't know, what do you think? Yeah, well, that's interesting. Like, why would you, like, you know, if you don't like what you do and uh, you don't believe in what you're doing, why would you want to, <laughs> is it just because of the money or? Oh, yeah, no. Or maybe it's not a, it's not a mix. It's, it's a, not a single. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. It's, it's definitely not because of the money. Um, yeah. I, I believe. Um, yeah, a, a lot of the people in, in the Musk companies are either there because they're mission driven, it looks like, yeah. or because they don't think they have a choice. 
And the second category might sound super loaded, but <clears throat> I think it's true. Quite a few of the people I worked with were career factory workers. And in the Musk companies, they might be in a knowledge work, what well, everyone does knowledge work, like everyone programs robots and everyone hauls equipment. You know, I mean, it's, it's labor and knowledge, labor and knowledge. Yeah. But a significant percentage of the people there are career factory employees. Uh, they're, maybe they have a criminal record. Uh, a lot of the people I talked to were ex-convicts. Um, wow. And they're like, it's just hard for me to get other types of work. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, they maybe were I, just to be frank, really ugly. And they're, they're like, people don't want me working front of house in a restaurant. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, maybe I can be a porter in the kitchen or a factory, you know, but I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm born the way I'm born or I had this accident. So I yeah. work in the factory. And truly in a Musk company, I've, I've never worked anywhere where it didn't matter even more what you look like. It did not matter. Most companies, there's this cast of kind of handsome people that are managers and up, and which is weird. I mean, really, it's 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 actually corrupt, and that does not happen in the Musk companies mm -hmm. at at all. It's just not a thing. Um, LBGTQ, uh, lesbian, bi, transgender, gay, uh, more than that, uh, yeah. has ranked the Tesla specifically, the best place in the world to work more, mm -hmm. more than five years, some big number of years running. Mm -hmm. And I think that's because you are only your output. Mm -hmm. I mean, truly. So if you want to just go and work somewhere and not be evaluated on how you did your hair or what norm you fit in, this is a really good place to do that. You, you, yeah. you just go and you're a printer. You're a printer and are you are you making this thing or not? And that's it. Like truly, that is it more than anywhere I've ever been. And that's good and bad because mm -hmm. say, say you're handsome and you're like, people should give me preferential treatment and I should have an office with a window. I'm handsome and this is what I'm used to. You're you're not gonna like it then because <laughs> <laughs> that's not gonna work for you, yeah. <laughs> no, that is yeah. not an advantage. Right. that that is i mean like like you said there is good and there is bad and it's really interesting uh, um to, to just you know uh, uh get a peek inside that and understand i'm trying to also think like you know how what's coming you know uh, in a sense what are the next five to ten years going to look like for the rest because i'm assuming some of this will will be in some ways uh try to be understood and applied uh, in other industries in uh, you know and uh, what do you think are the what's coming after the big a agile well the 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 musk model and i i want to give it a better name mm -hmm. um but it, it's a it's a specific type of agile because there's a lot of agile now or things that i mean anyone can call anything agile so there is a lot of non-helpful garbage that people mm -hmm. call agile and even spend a lot of money making pretty pictures and advertising as agile so it, it's it's hard for a lot of folks to know so the the musk model which i will say is a part of agile is going to be impossible to compete against mm -hmm. it, it's already impossible to compete against <clears throat> but it takes a very specific type of leader to implement. And I think very few people are going to implement it. The recipe is very simple. Uh, mm -hmm. to, to, to be Elon Musk is actually a very simple recipe. Um, and I actually even did it for a little while and had huge success. And I, and I think I might do it again. I'm relatively entrepreneurial. And I think many people will, but it, it takes a very specific personality to do it. And it's a decade longer, longer plan. And a lot of people think in two year, one year increments. So it, it, they'll, there'll be a lot of failures. There'll be a tremendous mm -hmm. amount of failures, uh, but anyone who's not trying it won't be able to compete. So you, you're gonna, we're, we are experiencing now sea change 
across all industry, and that's just going to keep going. There's a real opportunity, I believe, for you. And it's to take some of the best people practices, delight in your work practices, sustainable pace mm -hmm. practices that don't slow down companies and bring those to the people who are gonna be attracted to the Musk model. Mm -hmm. Elon gets it. Elon leads with make it fun. Elon has awesome coffee service across all the Musk companies. I mean, world-class. You would be challenged to get a better cup of coffee anywhere in the world. And it's there for everyone. It's totally egalitarian. It's not like the manager level gets this coffee. No, there is no manager yeah. level. But like everyone, <laughs> yeah. the janitorial staff, everyone gets awesome coffee service all the time. And the coffee people get awesome coffee all the time, right? Um, yeah. And the food service, they really try to make it Michelin three star. Right? So you, Elon gets it, make it beautiful, make it fun, make it fashionable. And he's always led with that. If you were a supermodel, you should feel comfortable working any of the jobs in any of the Musk companies. Yeah. That, that's the aspiration, right? Well, a lot of mm -hmm. people won't have that mindset and they'll just see the execution and that's going to make really bad working conditions. Mm -hmm. So what we as an agile community can do is reproduce this model, model, the part that works, but also the human centered design, the, hum the developer centered mm -hmm. design, uh, low cognitive load, um, walk up simple, self-organizing, well, all of which amplify the execution. Mm -hmm. But as someone who's only thinking in terms of execution could easily miss. Um, having really excellent working conditions that are cheap is an art that is not well understood. Mm -hmm. And this, is, I think, is going to be missed by a lot of companies. It's going to make some really awful working conditions. They'll probably be not in the must companies because they get it, but they'll probably be companies with series of awful accidents and burnout and employee theft, really unhappy people. And I want to minimize that or dampen the negative impact and help companies mm -hmm. do the better thing. How without slowing down, how without big cash output, can you make super fashionable, desirable, comfortable places to work that are performing at this level? And that's yeah. really Elon's genius. Like his first office for Zip2, I was not in there, but he says yeah. they rented the office. They didn't have, he and his brother or he and his cousin, they didn't have money to rent somewhere else. They slept in the office. They showered mm -hmm. in the YMCA. They didn't yeah. have enough money for two computers. So they had one that was uh, the server. And uh, at night, they would shut the server down and code. And it, on, on, because they had one computer. And during yeah. the day, they would, you know, stop coding and turn the server on. So the service ran, zip two, and they sold it for 20 million yeah. or something. Uh, so it, it worked. And how do you do that? Well, you make it the office, as far as I understood, was like a super fun place to work. It's where you wanted to crash at night. He had dates and yeah. the office was cool enough that you could bring your date there. It wasn't some dark yeah. smell place. It was a yeah. cool office. Cool place, yeah. yeah. It smelled good, even though they slept there. I mean, they made it nice <laughs> in my understanding. Yeah. And, and so it was charismatic and it was fashionable. Yeah. That's important. And yeah, I'm I, wanting I, to spend time there. Yeah. And like, it's like, you know, yeah, yeah, that's, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so let's make a lot more startups and make it really easy for people to take those as a package. This is where Agilists, Ward Cunningham really, are phenomenal. That thing, the Agile Manifesto, it's four sentences. Yeah, with a header and a footer, but four yeah. values. It's super simple. And there's 12 principles behind it and they're all good, but you don't have to know all 12 to get started. Mm -hmm. well, that's the game. How do you make this so simple it can play in the back of your mind like a poem you like, mm -hmm. like four sentences long? <laughs> yeah. That helps you totally kick ass. And that's what the Musk companies do with 
no management, almost no management with, I mean, it, it's, it's the real agile, none of this yeah. training and, <laughs> and yeah. all of this stuff. It's simple, right? It's, uh, it's don't complicate it. Keep it somewhat simple, right? But there's a lot of uncomplicated stuff that wouldn't make what the must companies make. Mm -hmm. So it's this very specific implementation that's not complicated. <laughs> uh, I'm excited about the future. I think, you know, uh, when I look at things, I think like we talked about, and again, maybe just to wrap it up, uh, you know, uh, if we look at just the history, a lot has happened and we're like, in a sense, yes, a lot of things have changed, but I'm I'm kind of excited about the future because uh, it used to be if even if we just look 200 years ago, 50 years ago, um, it was in my opinion a lot worse. But right after World War II, there was well actually during World War II, there was an innovation boom globally mm -hmm. everywhere that could. People were willing to throw themselves at work. Uh, and, and make it their life. And you're gonna have victory gardens at home to grow some of your own food. So you're self, more self-reliant. It's okay to work the factory job swing shift. It's okay to work yeah. double shifts, um, riveting airplanes together and designing while you rivet. And there's no new product introduction <laughs> making the Mustang II prop fighter plane. It's parts are changing on the line all the time. Like this was normal. This was normal. And that generation kept that going in business. And so you had the containerization movement of shipping, which completely changed global supply chain. You had many, many, many innovations rippling out. And then what happened is their kids were all entitled. And as they got jobs, they're like, well, I wanna sit in an office and have meetings because meetings are fun. Well, then what happens? People in meetings that don't do with their hands got all frustrated and bored. Like imagine if you had a Lego set where you didn't get to touch it. You only could tell someone else what piece to put together. I've seen kids yeah. play that way and they get angry and fight. Well, that's <laughs> companies now, yeah. that's companies now. And it's the kids of the kids of the kids from this highly productive generation that made the Lego sets, right? <laughs> well, what yeah. we're seeing now is people who are gonna be making themselves. Elon works the line in Tesla. He glues parts together, he rivets, he sleeps in a sleeping bag in the factory. When the executive team at Renault is willing to do that, then I'll buy Renault stock. But until then, it's <laughs> kids telling other kids how to put Lego sets together and those are all gonna fail.